what we're listening to is we're going to play you about 10 or 12 minutes of what my brother recalls getting in the water. All right, uh, there's, this whole interview is over an hour. We don't have the time for it. So I'm going to just hope you can hear the audio on this. There's nothing to look at. Um, the map you see is, and I think, Marianne, you got an X on that, if you can see it back there. I can't see it from here. There's a red or something. Or the sinking was about 400 miles south of Iceland. And as I did my latitude longitudinal studies, it's not, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from the Titanic, so it's resting in the company. Um, it'll most likely never, ever be found, but that's where it's supposed to be. We had, I think, one, two, three, maybe six life rafts. Oh, we tried it over. And two or three of these big... I said, come on, Jim. But he wouldn't do it. He just sat there. So Luke and I, now Luke has no jacket. He gave it to somebody else. Oh, no, I got a jacket, but he doesn't. Okay. I don't know how that happened. Yes, sir. You have to realize my two young ones are actually interrupting every 30 seconds. So. Oh, I got you. Let him lose his story. Turn it up again. All right. So now, what are we going to do? No life rafts. They all were released. And they have people from your ship leave them in life rafts. Oh. They jumped in the water to get on the life rafts. We had, I think, one, two, three, maybe six life rafts, and two or three of these big, big life nets. There were these big rubberish balls with rope between them. Oh, three or four times the size of this room, they just throw it aside and float on the water. I looked over, I saw a guy jumping and getting tangled in it. And then they disappeared. It's all as simple as that. I said, oh, my shit, I'm up over the edge. <laughs> so we had this boatswain that just, chief boatswain mate. Boatswain mate's a guy that is supposed to know all about the ship, where the ropes are, how to do this and how to do that. He's a general all around, brain, he's the most. Where he got the rope, I don't know. He tied it, tied it on the forward hawser, which is a big steel thing that's set in the, the deck that you tie it to a dock. He threw the rope over the side. He said, when you go over, go down and go down slow. Don't jump in the water, the shop will kill you. Right? A couple of guys went down, I'm waiting, but I don't go. It was a Polish kid there. I can't remember his name. I remember him being Polish. Anyway, finally Luke was down. So, when he started down, I started down. Now we're 30, 40 feet in the air. So down he's going to the side of the ship. You see oil, guys are all in the middle. It Another torpedo. Uh, not sure. I didn't see it when he told me that. So I get down, this Polish kid's coming down at her, big son. He's standing on my shoulders. His feet are on my shoulders. And see, I'm saying, ski. Let me get down first, then you come down. I'll wait for him to walk. The minute my feet touch the water, I say, this is it. No way I can get out of this. This is impossible. This 700 miles, there isn't a soul in sight. Nothing. Just guys screaming. Mom, dear Christ's sake, down I Touch the water. Bang, he let go. I'm sitting right on my shoulder. Down I go. Right? <laughs> I'm out of sight. And he's got me scissored with his feet. Yeah. yeah. And he's on me. He must weigh 180, 200 pounds. And he's got me scissored with, with his feet. He can't, oh, you're like, I don't know how he got out. Just reached up and got one leg out and pulled my head out and up I came. I never saw him. Where did he? No idea. And I'm right next to him. I hear Luke. Where are you? See him, so I swim. I feel like I'm going about 98 miles an hour, probably through four feet a minute. Mm -hmm. that. I get to him, he disappears. I reach and pull him up. He said, I'm trying to take my shoes off. Look at his hands now, they're half again what they were. Because of the cold. So I said, hold on. Hold on to me. So we got to get away from the ship, it's going under. And look back, and see guys jumping on. Some guys sitting on the bed praying to God, afraid to move. Somebody. Anyway, you hear crack, crack, 
bright glow. Somebody had presence of mind to shut everything down. All the motors were shut down. The whole thing, right? The ship was gone. Now there's over 200 guys in the water. So we swim. I don't remember how it happened. I don't know what happened. I look around, and every time Luke's right hand would come out, he had a cross. I swear. Big wooden cross. What do you think? He said, just floating. So I just picked it up. I don't know. It looked like it was made. It was square. It was like two, about that square, that long, about that wide, this being longer. It was just that you would swear you get, if you bought it in the store. It was a piece of wood from the fur from furniture or from the galley. I have no idea where it came from. To this day, it baffles me. But that's what he's swimming. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, and for no reason at all, there's a rat. Oh, wow. One of the life rats. Just, there it is. Nobody on it. Unreal. But it's upside down. It didn't make any difference. It's like a big donut with a picket fence in between. So you were always in water. You know, this is the kind of thing that happened there. And they had equipment on it. They had barrels of barrel water, which we had put raisins in to make whiskey. Oh. <laughs> but it was underneath. Mm -hmm. I think I didn't turn over. There's no way to turn over. Look it on. They had rings around. I just stuck my arm through a ring. They started to pick up guys. Spinning. All the spinning. So the life rafts hold about comfortably, safely, about 10 and 12 feet. Next thing I know, I'm just, I'm still in the water. I'm holding on. There's 20, 25 guys on. There's no way to be on. I, I, I'm saying, she's my time. I think I'll take a nap. And then, <laughs> so I, I, off I go. Boom. Bang! Punches me in the nose. She's Isn't that something? Isn't that something? There was a cop in the bay. <laughs> From Worcester. A Frenchman. I can't remember his name. He's lying in my lap. I, I think I'm getting high. Luke says, hit him. I said, I am. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. Stops the spread. All right. Since Walter says we better make room, reach down and pick him up. And Luke says, "Don't do that." And I said, "Jesus, Luke's got a heart. You know, he wants his jacket. Give me his life jacket." Well, it was almost impossible to take the jacket off. Mm -hmm. we, we can't move. We just can't move. I look down. My legs are filling my pants. My little legs are now big legs. My shoes. Impossible. I don't know, how could you get shoes on the football game? But there they were. We were in there and they had them with their hands. They look back, see the ship, you see the front of the ship sticking up, pointing at the sky, the back of the ship up, pointing at the sky, buckled up like somebody was going to fold a newspaper. Same thing. Just like you picked it up like this. It went smack. Out of nowhere. Destroyer. Oh a destroyer escort. USS Harrison. The Joyce. It's the USS Harrison. Harrison. They get the number, D318, I think. It's not matter. Mm -hmm. Look, see. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you, it's just like movies. Just like movies. They would stop. And you try to pick up guys. Goddamn sentence is still there. And you see them, you know, in the center. You go, oh, oh, oh. They take off. They were, they were, we're not a small ship at that Plenty of power. They were dodging, dodging torpedoes all this time when they're trying to pick oh. us up. Some of us, anyway. Very famous quote uh, by Captain Wilcox, or Lieutenant Commander Wilcox at the time. And Every time I hear it, I just sends chills up my spine. Because as I had told you, he came literally three times and twice was turned around by torpedoes. And he personally was on the bullhorn. And you can understand these men were scattered over a two mile area. And the longest was in the water over seven hours, which was an incredible feat.
feet under it. So, and he just over the bullhorn said, God bless you, we're under fire, we'll be back. And he did it. Finally, they got to our raft, right? So, I mean, look up there, you look out quite a bit, the guy's looking over the deck, you're hollering, you're, come on, grab something. So they had a life net hung over. She couldn't hold on. You get your arm in the air, saw a guy get his arm in the air, everything else, the torpedo, off the ship would go, off he'd go, to get it. If he's from here to the chair away from him, there's nothing you can do. There's half you can't reach out and take There's nothing you can't. It's impossible. I can't explain it. But you can't say it. He's gone. <coughs> Three or four feet is the, is the difference between living and dying. It's from here to there. Two more steps this way, you can say one more step that way. He's a dead man. And he's looking at you. And you say, I'm sorry, but you're dead. He's, I, I can't do anything. You just can't. I have nothing to give you. Not even my hand. Finally, we get up next to the ship. Look up there, and there's a big, look at the tag, me. Guy, nothing but a skippy shirt on. Nervous, cold weather with a rope around him. They let them down. He's grabbing guys, one handed. Picking them up, dumping them, coming back, and doing them. I get on the life net. Dixon, can you make it? I'm going to try. One by one, I get up there, and I'm here, and I'm here, and I just feel, and I feel, and I get myself another one of the rope. Finally, two or three guys reach down and grab me by the life jacket. Ah! I, they throw me on the deck just like a, like a uh, catching fish. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. When it was all over, and we left, there were, out of the 218 guys, I'm not sure of this number, but there were, there were less than 30. Mm -hmm. Get back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there I am, and I'm on the deck, and somebody says to me, What would you like? I said, Who's got a shot? <laughs> somebody says, Sparky, I got one for you. I said, Who the hell knows me? You know who it is? Mm -hmm. On this ship, out in the middle of the Atlantic, 700 miles away from no place. Is my neighbor, Dr. Henry's son. Dr. Henry, who delivered your father, and me, and Rose, and Anne, and Arthur, who delivered all of us, mother's daughter, my daughter. His son is on the USS Harrison. Now, are you talking about coincidence? Uh, can I? <laughs> he's dead. He's this car. the hell? I think it's Richard Dick. Yeah, he answered me half a bottle of booze. <laughs> Got me down below and sit this way and pass it around. He threw us in the bunk, got us to Ireland. Well, did Luke make it? Oh, yeah, Luke makes it. Jerry did. Those were members of the gun because they were about seven of them. Uh, you've got to get back to something different here in a second. When was that, like was that done? When did he record this? About 1988. All right, we're going to do uh, about five more minutes. Well, in either case, 28 people survived that day uh, due to the heroics of the crew of the USS Joyce. Uh, you have to realize, these, these guys on those two ships partied together when they got to port. They had dances together. Um, it's like one of the uh, crew members of the Joyce, and the name escapes me, as he said, my best friend was Sam Lowe, who were both engineers in the, in the engine room, and he said he was on the Leopold, I was on actually the Kirkpatrick, and he said, uh, and our ships were switched, he said, I should be a problem the Vietnam, not, not Sam Lowe. So there's a lot of, lot of interesting things happening here when, when I heard my brother mention Richard Henry. Uh, our Connor store was Boston and Essex, which is now Mandy's. There was a shell station and it was Dr. Henry. And we lived around the corner and Henry was my darkie. He delivered all five of us brats. And uh, to have his son, who actually I find out having interviewed my other brother, 
Richard Henry was a senior at MIT when he enlisted, and my brother was a sophomore at MIT when he enlisted in the Army. So they knew each other from ROTC at, at MIT just prior to the war. And uh, how small does the world get? With World War II, you're in the middle of the North Atlantic, and your next door neighbor offers you a drink? <laughs> I mean, come on. So, you know, when I heard that story, and the first thing I had to do was, you know, because my brothers made a few mistakes. Some of these old timers get their facts a little confused. And I can understand that 70 years later. I mean, it's a war, and I think the last thing you worried about was, was the number of the ship. But it wasn't the Haverson. The Haverson was there, but she was steaming out with the rest of the convoy and probably 100 miles away by now. Um, the idea was to preserve what was left of the convoy, not worry so much about the survivors. Uh, but to hear that, you, you got to check it out. And I checked it out the only way I could. I asked everybody on the Joyce, do you remember them? And they all went, no. And I'm going, then he couldn't have been on the Joyce. And then I get the muster list. Uh, the National Archives and Son of the Gun, Ensign Richard Henry. Yeah, he was on the Joyce. Apparently, a lot of these people didn't know each other, and the enlisted really didn't know too many of the officers other than maybe the captain and the exec. Unless you worked in his division, they were all strangers, they were gathered together like this and off the war. You really didn't have too many people you knew other than your <coughs> people in the bunk next to you and people on your duty station or your weapon system. And that was it. So in either case, uh, the 28 survivors make it to Ireland. Uh, there's another interesting story, and I get this from Freddie, uh, uh, Fred on the, on the Kirk, Kirkpatrick. It was one of the survivors from the Leopold who was so impressed by the rescue of the Joyce that he subsequently joined the Joyce crew when he got back to the States. And there was another fellow who, when they got to Ireland and were taking these people back, got on the Kirkpatrick. Some came back on the Queen Mary. My brother was due to come back on the Queen. I'm in Bergen, came back on the Queen Mary. I can't imagine that ship traversing the Atlantic Ocean during the war, but it did to get people back and forth. Um, this one guy got on the Kirkpatrick and they're ready to set sail, and he's insisting. He said, I need to see your captain. He said, you don't. I'm going to jump overboard when we're out in the ocean. I'm going to drown myself. We'll get you to the captain. So Barnabas comes down the same way I had to deal with the crazy cook that went to Belfast. Apparently the Kirkpatrick was the eight ball of this unit. And this guy goes up to him and he said, Captain, he said, I will commit suicide unless you promise me when we get back, you give me a death stroke. And the captain looks at him and he said, you 27 of your shipmates made it. You made it. You don't understand. I was merchant marine. This is my third torpedoing. I can't do it again. I got him a desk job. Okay. True story. But to be exact, almost 37 days, 38 days later, we're in April 16, and we're back in right outside of New York Harbor, and they're forming up another convoy to go over. They've lost the Leopold. The Leopold's now been replaced by the USS Gandy. Same other five ships, Escort Division 22. The Gandy now is Navy manned. There wasn't a Coast Guardsman on it, so you have five Coast Guard manned ships, one Navy. And they're mustering just outside <coughs> what's called Ambrose Light. And I don't remember the convoy number. It's not essential. But there's a damn German U-boat, and it sinks the world's largest tanker, the Pan Pennsylvania. Now, if you hear some of the stories, and this is Freddie Fairbanks again, and I take Freddie with a grain of salt. He is 93 years old, but I'll tell you, he's funny and he's accurate, and he follows up everything with an email. And Freddie said, yep, they were trying to sink an aircraft carrier and miss hit the tanker. Oh, I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, there was this big British ship. He said, you couldn't fly on it. It was just, they flattened everything. They took the bridge and everything off other than a little pilot house. And they had all these planes going to England. You couldn't fly them because there was no deck to take off on, but they were all on the deck. And the Germans were trying to sink it. And up comes the Pan Pennsylvania gets the torpedo burn ships, as you can see. And again, world's largest tanker. And you can see the U-boat right there. Uh, these are classic photos. They've been on the internet. They're part of the Coast Guard file. And somehow or another, just lost this button. Um, 
This is the crew of the Joyce at Battle Stations, and let me tell you, everybody I have interviewed on the Joyce, and I have talked to seven survivors, said, when we saw that stuff, we gave it everything we had. There wasn't a gun that was, wasn't fired until we ran out of ammunition. That was the revenge for losing our sisters on the Leopold. And you can see the Germans in the water, and, and even a couple of them said, I knew they were dead, and I just kept shooting. And it felt good. I mean, it's war as hell. And you can see, if you look at that U boat, you can see the holes in the conning tower. I mean, they were pummeling that thing until it was, it was Swiss cheese. They did manage to rescue um, 13 Germans, um, two, the two leading officers. One died, and they buried him at sea the next day, which uh, those are some of the Germans. One of the Germans was a 16-year-old Norwegian who was conscripted. And he was so happy that the war had just ended for him. And they're burying the German in an American flag. And if you look very carefully to the left, you can see that somebody's there with a machine gun, just in case. Because um, those are Germans surrounding. And that's Wilcox with the Bible. Um, and they also buried three of the Leopold the night when they did the rescue of them and went back to England because three of them had died on board, the originally 31 taken. And if I played the tape a little further, uh, you would have heard the description of that. But uh, that guard is off the Pan Pennsylvania. They lost most of the crew. They saved about 30. And they were protected by what's called Navy Guard. They're active duty Navy that were put on these, these tankers and stuff to help defend the ship as it crossed the Atlantic Ocean. There is one thing I did not mention. Um, the next day after the rescue of um, the sailors of the Leopold, the order was given. The, the stern rolled over and eventually sunk, and that's where most of them were lost. No officers survived that night. They were just enlisted men. Um, the oldest survivor was 33, most of them were less than 22, and some of them, a good majority, were teenagers. When they, the sunset came up at around 6, 7 the next morning on the 10th of March, the order came down, sink the bow, because it's in a major sea lane and we can't have ships at night striking it. So they went over to the ship, they rendezvoused around, and they noticed that there was a sailor dangling off the right starboard side he got caught in an anchor chain going overboard. And the seas were so rough, he was slammed in the head and obviously died overnight. And Wilcox said, I will not fire at one of my, one of my men. And he took the ship around wow. and to the opposite side so that they didn't have to see the dead body. And the, the marksmen on the ship were, were the black stewards that they had out in the galley in those days. These guys were tremendous marksmen. They were scared to death of loading it and firing it, but boy, they could hit an eye of a mosquito from 100 yards. And they put two armor-piercing shells right into the bow, and it went in one side and came out the other, and it's still floating, and Wilcox says, that's it, death shots are gone, you know And they sunk it and took off for Londonbury. So, there you go. And there they are, they're, they're got 12 German prisoners on the dock in Londonderry, and they were taken off the ship by one enlisted Coast Guardman, totally unarmed, and they were picked up by, again, a full platoon of Royal Marines with rifles. The Germans, the, the, the cook on the Joyce, the, the first morning, he got up and he said, who do I make for the Germans for food? He said, I don't know how to cook German. Does anybody know? I mean, it's like, the, you know, we're going to be civil, we're going to be civil. And again, that is another interesting letter from the few survivors of the Pan Pennsylvania that uh, they wrote thanking the Joyce. Now, there's some interesting stories. Uh, the Joyce, basically, what had happened once the sub torpedo, the Pan Pennsylvania, the sub, in order to escape, you got a forming convoy, so you got all kinds of battle wagons around there. He hid under the tanker went right under his hull, figuring nobody's going to find me here, right? And the tanker really was burning, but, you know, maybe a controllable fire would probably float. Well, he waited a couple of hours. He heard nothing on his sonar, so he started to come out. 
But before he did that, Wilcox is all over the place looking for him. He's got the SOBs under, under the pen, Pennsylvania. So he takes his destroyer up there and drops death charges so accurately that one hit the, the hull of the sub, right on the sub and exploded. And of course, the sub had to come up. Um, at that point, the other two destroyer escorts were the USS Peterson and the Navy man, Gandhi, gets a little controversial here because everybody I talked to on the Joyce said, we decimated the U-255, 550, I'm sorry, we decimated it. And I said, what about the Peterson? They said, oh, they shot a few rounds. But what had happened is the Gandhi, again, Navy man, <coughs> claims they rammed it and sunk it. Well, again, Freddie on the Kirkpatrick said, I'm on the radio room and I'm listening to the battle. We're about six miles up the coast forming. And he said, the Gandhi was dead in the water. I said, can't be. I interviewed people on the Gandhi. They claim they, they did it. He said, it's because they're Navy. They don't want to give the reward to the Coast Guard. That Coast Guard sunk the damn U-550. He said, they were a dead stop. It's the biggest error any captain can make, because if you have to get under power, it's going to take you 15 or 20 minutes, because you've got to get those diesels running and pressed air and all that other stuff. I don't know. Don't know. You'll have to reach into the radiograms. They're in the Navy Historical Museum. They guard them like your platinum wearing gold wafers or something, and you can't get them. But I take Fred for what it's worth. Freddie is Freddie. Um, so it could have gone either way. In either case, the Joyce did the most damage. Six on the Gandhi got a Purple Heart. They, so they got wounded. Not from the submarine, but from the ricochet from the Joyce putting so many bullets, it hit the Gandhi and injured six of their men. Well, it's just an interesting story. Friendly fire, I guess. Well, uh, of the 28 that were rescued, were they all in fairly good physical condition? Oh, no. Six of them, seven of them spent almost six months in England in hospitals. No, they weren't. Now, again, this, this just occurred July 23rd this year. They found that sunken submarine. Or at least they think they have. Uh, this is a group of people, Joe Maserani, who's a uh, criminal defense attorney in New York, and I think Gary Kovac, a Kozak, uh, who is a sonar expert. They had been looking for the 550 for several years, and they just found it um, on sonar image, which I didn't, didn't copy for it, I'm sorry. And if they found it, I think that's fantastic. If they didn't, we don't know what it is because it sure as hell is a submarine and it's, it's like it says, it's found up in Nantucket and Montauk, uh, New York. So it, it's got to be the 550. In either case, um, to finish this up very quickly, you know, a formal board of inquiry was held and went eight days. They didn't come up with any profound findings. Uh, I think they made one statement, and I, I believe it was a negative one concerning uh, the escort commander, uh, Kenner, for only sending one DE back for rescue. Um, they had recommended it would have been better if he sent two, one to screen for the sub and one to pick up survivors. Uh, Kenner's statement was he had 27 ships, he was now down to four protective escorts, he was in no <coughs> submarine area, and he just didn't feel he could spare the second ship. That's a tough call. I mean, you know, for the guys that are there, you're going to make these decisions in a split second, right, wrong, and different, I don't know. They talked about the equipment, about the immersion, about coal, you know, there were no lights on these light vests, so they couldn't be found. And probably not only the Joyce, I think what really, really helped uh, in that torpedo junction there was a major air gap. Planes couldn't fly far enough to get there, but by this time the B-24 was, was online and functioning, and the B-24 Liberator was sent out of Iceland, and I believe that scared the 255 away, or would have done everything in its power to sink the Joyce also. Uh, but when they came over and lit up the sky and started firing the new 255, it took off. The finality of all this is what happens now. We've, we've got three survivors. They've got their purple heart. Uh, as best my mathematics can determine, there were 21 who were never recognized for that day that survived. They're now passed on. And uh, I found a little blurb at the end of a 600-page board of inquiry that stated 
These gentlemen, all of the proof of the Leopold, will be issued a purple part. General Order 186, All Navy, Article 26-44. We took that up with the Coast Guard about eight months ago, and I said, Dean, I'm back again. And she, she's going, oh, my. Nice. <laughs> and I said, you know, thank you for my brother. Thank you for Harry. What about the 21 and the other guy? And she said, well, you know, I'm right there. Right, right, right. I said, no. I said, I found the article from the inquiry, the Board of Inquiry, that demands that they get the award. And he said, well, i got to find the article. And it took them three months to find it because it's in the JAG unit, Historical Archives of the U.S. Navy. The Navy hides everything. It's gone. But they found it. And I got an email from her about four months ago saying we will award. The Admiral has agreed. And the whole board, we are going to have a ceremony for those 21 who never got it. You will be invited. It will be in Washington, D.C. It was going to be on Memorial Day, but they had big changes of command up here. And it's going to be in the early fall, sometime after Labor Day. So that's the conclusion of the story, and I'm hoping the conclusion of the book. And I'm done. <laughs>